Voyages of Tim Better Podcast. Greetings, Voyagers. Welcome to the Voyages of Tim Vetter podcast. This is episode number 162. My guest for today's episode is Dawa Yangsum Sherpa. She is a Sherpa and a mountain guide from Nepal. I first saw her story posted online through, I think it was Camp 4, and there's a really great article that I used as some research for this from Outsider Mag. Or Outside Mag, Yeah. So I will post to that in the show notes for this episode so that you can find that. But yeah, I've had this, I don't know, this fascination lately with Nepal. Uh, It's not my voyage because I haven't been there, uh, but I will get there. But the, the people and the stories and the culture that come out of there are really, really wonderful. I mean, probably most people know about Everest, but... I had uh, someone on the podcast a while ago that worked on a film called The Last Honey Hunter. Go check that out. That's an amazing doc. Um, And then I had Mira, and now I have Dawa. She also, like Mira, grew up in a village and, you know, at a young age didn't have access to a formal education. I think her her schooling ended at 11. She did not have electricity in her village. And she's written and she said that it was, it was tough. It's, it's a hard upbringing. She even says in this episode that like uh, people from Nepal, from the villages, they're tough. They grow up on the mountain. They have to be tough. Uh, and she, she left home at 13 and she wanted to be a climber and she wanted to be a guide. And she's the first certified guide who is a woman from Nepal. And if you look at all the certified guides, it's a, it's a heavily male-dominated field. So she's really breaking a mold. And what she's doing, and the, she'll get into it in this episode, but what she's doing to help young women in a number of different ways is really inspiring. And I, I say this to her, but it makes me feel so lazy. She's doing so much. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool to connect with people during this time. You know, she... It's, I had to get up here at 5.30 to adjust for the time difference. And, uh, you know, I'm calling into Nepal, into Kathmandu. And we're able to connect in a time when, you know, I can't even connect with my neighbors and the people in my own community because we, we can't be face-to-face with people. So uh, it's both strange in a way, but also really cool that I'm able to get these done remotely. But <laughs> I can't wait to get back to face-to-face conversations with people. And uh, I can't wait to get n- to Nepal because now there's a, a growing list of people that I know there that I want to actually meet and do follow-up episodes with. So uh, yeah, please go to the show notes for this episode where I'll link to, to Dawa's story and to her social media and stuff like that so that you can find out more about her and maybe follow and connect so that you can follow along with her journey. She's deeply, deeply inspiring to me. And this was another really cool one for me. This was great. Uh, you'll also find in the show notes a link to my Patreon account. You know what that is, but it's a su- subscription-based service where you can give monthly to keep these stories coming. And there's some kickbacks like postcards from around the world and stickers and T-shirts and stuff like that. So if not, please you know share word of mouth. That goes a really long way uh, to uh, share this virally with people. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I had a great time talking to her and... Uh, I hope you enjoy her story. Well, I know it's a it's a crazy time right now. What's it like in in Kathmandu? Is it a strict quarantine? Yeah, it's been locked down for like forty five days, and uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, so the shops and groceries are open at evening and evening for two hours and morning for two or three hours. Then all the time is just shut down and we can walk, uh, go outside, just inside the home. Do you live in Kathmandu now? No, uh, yeah, I am in Kathmandu right now. Okay. I, I would imagine that, you know, for, for guides, uh, it, depend, yeah. it depends on tourism. Um, 
Yeah. So is that really tough right now for guides? Because I would imagine nobody's climbing. Yeah, I think this uh, is normally the spring season, basically one of the most like busiest season of the year, spring, because of the Everest season. Yeah. So, yeah, and this big lockdown since March. So that's, that's the biggest hit for the economic for for Nepal and uh, lots for the guides and all the people who depend on tourism, like the hotels, guys, porters, and a lot of things. Do you work during the ever season? I normally work um, summer in America, in the United States. I guide, I guide on Denali in Alaska and Washington State, uh, like Glacier Mountain for three months or four months summer. And then I also guide our Mount Aconcagua in the winter time. Um, but it's sometime last year I took a break, but it's some September, like autumn and spring. I work in Nepal as a guiding. Ah, I got you. So what is the name of the village that you grew up in? I am go. I grew up in the Walling Valley, which is uh, located west from the Everest region. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's called the Walling Valley, and it's also a share population. And the culture are, or everything is similar from the Kumbu, and people who live there are Sherpas. And Sherpa is basically our last name, a family name. So, yeah, all a very small Sherpa village called Walling. So when you were a kid, did yeah. what do most people think? I know like there's the, the Sherpa name and then there's the job of being a Sherpa. Did I think did most people think that they would grow up to, to be guides or is there is there a different path uh, to adulthood? I think Sherpa, I think when so we Sherpa means people from the east and Eastern part, so we moved from Eastern Park to Tibet, so and migrated to Nepal. So I think Sherpa means we call people from East, and we've been lived in mountains since long time. And uh, so whatever we do, our getting water, getting food, uh. Uh, wood, and everything is on the snow and mountain. So I think when the Westerner came to the to climb mountain, and I think they took, they had this relationship with Sherpa people, and they took them to the mountain and they were very strong. So that's how the the name, our last name changed into the like a position. So that's why Sherpa is known as a climber and because I think they lived in um, high mountain valley and I think they are very strong in the genetically in the mountain. So I think as even, even for me, I was born in, I am born in a village of 4,200 meters, which is 14,000 feet high. Wow. So we used to grow and play around those elevations. That's why I think we are very, our lungs are like more bigger than others. So that's why the Sherpa is really strong in the mountain. So that's how there is being like a generation to next generation. Like Sherpa are like, all, most of the 80% climber are Sherpa family. And not only... But if there is a Sherpa, even there's another Sherpa who are students and businessmen, farmers, or, so they have also different jobs. So uh-huh. Sherpa can do either, Sherpa is just the last name and they can do any job. I see. So, but mm-hmm. the expectation for who will become a guide or a climber, I've read through learning about your story that that expectation is usually for, uh, for young men and boys, right? But not for women. Yeah, so I think uh, we in Nepal and our country, uh, women's is, human job is take care of family and stay home, kids, and men go for jobs. So, and uh, this is what I do does it. Even we have very few female who does this job. So this is a very um, not totally acceptable for women who wants to do this kind of job because. Even there's not even 10% of guides are females. 
more like very 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 few men guys here so yeah it is not a not a good expectation from the family that girl to do those this thing so this is uh, the, what i do, do this my job is very different than the <laughs> other girl so because i am never home and i follow i think i'm travel so much because of the climbing season because i follow a summer every continent mm. so because of those i i'm never in the same place for like such a long time uh this time i am almost two months at my home so this is the longest time i've ever stayed wow for a long long time so yeah so it's not a good expectation but i think it's true is little bit changing and now the younger generation kind of uh, more educated and the older generation are more not uh they live this for a living they climb mountain for a living and this is was the, their only job so now these days a lot of our, their kids they don't want their kids to do the same what they do so now they have been more education they're trying to give them uh, their kids like a lot of education so now the, the next generation like our or like the younger are going through some different jobs and some of some of the kids also wanted to climb because their family name and all this so it's a little tough well i think that you're also helping to change that right have you seen how your impact is changing people's mindsets yeah so i was only one since i've been i am only only female guys from Nepal who work for uh who's internationally certified uh, and so now I do this every winter I do a training for the, the younger girls who are who really wanted to do this kind of job and I kind of mentor them so last this last winter was my first team so I took 10 girls to the Kumbu Climbing Center uh, which is founded by American climber and Connor Anchor and his wife Jenny so I took them there and one I was one of the graduate students from that school so I took there and since I'm with North Face and I got some funding from North Face to support those girls so through North Face and Kumbu Climbing Center and ADC I support uh, girls to become a guide because I just uh, showing them a path how to start it so yeah i'm just starting by 10 girls and some of the girls are a uh, victim from like human trafficking so wow. it's very good it's a good really good project to um, to give them take them outdoor world and different world and uh, help them from the traumatized or so that was my uh, project and every every year i take trained 25 girls just the rock climbing introduction course and 10 10 to the really a, a really cool climbing like two weeks of training including ice climbing rock climbing and a lot of adventure and hiking and yeah that's my beginning since last year uh, but but another before I was so busy with my all my things yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's very grateful to have North Face on the backup, so they also support me for like a lot of finance and and other sponsors. Yeah, that's amazing. When you know, yeah. I, I think I read that you left your village at thirteen. Is is that the first time that you did a a real serious climb? Yeah, I think I when I grew up this mountain, and I never imagined that I would climb that boat one day. But when I live in my my hometown, uh the they grow up the, they they dig they, they they do a farming and all the boys goes away i think uh I, away for doing their job and uh, all the women left at the village and they all they do all the farming and wood and so i've been watching this this things like all the season they're like every every everything is like same time every there is nothing beyond that they are doing same thing all the time like autumn summer winter autumn summer winter and the air just goes by so much and they they cut the wood and they burn it they make the, they, the potato field and then they eat it and they they 
they take care of, they take care of the cows and I never I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to see like I do something different. So I said I don't want to live in village. I want to go out and see different world. And I want to do I. That's why I left my hometown with uh, 13 and and uh, came to city and stayed with my brother because uh, I want to go do something, but not like all the time same thing and same thing over and over. Just <laughs> staying at home. It was a very beautiful home and it's a hometown, but it's very nice to be there, but it's not like I want to just be old here. So I thought I want to go out. Yeah. What do you, yeah. what do you have to do to get uh, certified as a guide? I know it's a very intense process. Yeah. It's a 10 years of experience. I think a lot of trainings and a lot of exams, a lot of, uh, technical training experience. So uh, we had a climb. I, this is, I, I think I did a lot about climbing training. I started my climbing since 2008, but then I, after 2012, I started my climbing in 2008 when I was like teenager. And then I never, I started, I, I, took a training course just because I wanted to climb Mount Everest. Only that was my dream, but nothing beyond that. I will want to be a mountain guide. So I went to training and I want to be fit because I just, my dream was just summit Everest and I'm done. But after Kumbu climbing school, the KCC and another NMA, different Nepal government training, uh, I got a, very good opportunity with Connor Anchor to summit Everest in 2012 with the National Geographic Expedition. So he chose me to go to that expedition. And then, yeah, that was really, it was like really great moment for me because I am able to climb Everest. Then after I summit my Everest, I thought, oh, I want to make this passion into my profession and I want to be more uh, internationally certified or like me going to professionally. So I took lots of training and I went through this training course. It was not easy because I needed to compete with our boys and I was only one woman. And so I had in the, in this mountain, we, there is no category between male and female. So we had to do the same thing. So that was very hard during the exam and competition and all the physical level and of course, it was quite expensive, so I need to balance like doing job and paying for training, doing job as a trekking guide or like smaller peaks and then pay. And so it took me like almost five to six years to complete my certified wow. as a, being a certified guide. Wow! How, how many times have you climbed Everest? I summited two thousand. I climbed uh, once in two thousand twelve, and I summit. I was, I guided a National Geographic, I was a supporting guided, because we have a lot of guides, we have big Sherpa team, but I was guiding one of the scientists for this National Geo Expedition, so last year, but I didn't summit, but I've been to 85, 8,500 meters, and I need to turn around, and I supposed to go this year, but it's all canceled. Yeah. <laughs> how did you, um, yeah. how did you get discovered by North Face? Uh, so Conrad Anchor and uh, I, because in 2012, I did the North Face Expedition. It's like North Face and National Geographic Expedition. And at those time, I worked for them. And I worked with uh, Conrad and Hillary and a lot of Emily, a lot of us North Face athletes during those expeditions. So that's how I knew all the North Face team. And mainly I went through this uh Kumbu Climbing Center training. So I met Conrad Anchor and Jenny Lowe. So I think they also really helped me. And that's how I got to this. Uh, they just the North Face because of the a lot of athletes. And, uh, and do you, um, I think I had seen, I, I think I first saw about your story through maybe someone from like Camp 4 or I had someone on the podcast named Ben Ayers and, and he helped to create a film 
from Nepal called The Last Honey Hunter. Did you work with any of those yeah. folks? Yeah, I know. I know Ben and Renan, Ben Aries. Ben Aries worked for the foundation in Nepal. Uh, He's, he lives in Nepal. And uh, I know Renan and uh, Azurk. And so, yeah, I, I know them all well. I see. Okay, cool. Yeah, that must have been it then. You know, yeah. I've read before that um, without without porters, without Sherpas, without guides, most people wouldn't make it up Everest. Do, yeah, that's do, true. Do, yeah, okay. Do you ever... I mean, true. I know that, you know, there's a lot of injury. There's also death. I had read uh, through one of your postings once that you've actually, like, you know, walked around dead bodies summiting a mountain. Um, does it ever, like, frustrate you when people aren't necessarily prepared uh, to do something that like is very meaningful, but also very dangerous. Yeah, I think especially in Mount Everest, uh, not like I got Denali, Aconcagua, and a lot of other mountains, but especially in Everest, I think uh, we also a lot of big. We have a lot of a uh, big competition between the operators and a lot of the companies. So I think they take whoever has money and. So the, the the people who take the clients, they are most of them are not a they're businessmen and they take a lot of money. Whoever have money, then they climb Everest. Mm. So they take any every client and then and they go to the mountain and then and then the guys cannot handle and the guys have to do something a lot of things. So most of the clients who die there are like a lot of. Either they doesn't listen, either they are like a very old or inexperienced, because uh, Sherpa are the one who do everything there. They fix the tent. They just had to walk and sit and poop and sleep <laughs> because like a lot of not lot not all of them. Most of them are very well trained, very nice, but some of them are not prepared. So those are that makes it really difficult for the not only Sherpa, but also for other climbers who are very well, not well physically well, they, I think they also makes us really hard for other clients, other climbers, like a traffic jam or like they, they're ahead and they just stop walking and then, and the, the people who are walking behind get stuck. And yeah, so a lot of people who are, most of them are people, like not physically well, mm. and I think that's how it's a very big problem in in uh, Everest. And uh, it it doesn't it this doesn't happen to like another mountain like like Denali. I guide Denali and I I Aconcagua. I did a lot of peaks, but only on Everest they just rely on all which for Sherpa. So I think they are not prepared. And I think a lot of people that they just take money and send them to mountain without any training. So uh, not all, but some of few companies. Is there an organization or does the government help to step in and protect Sherpas and provide, make sure that they're safe also and make sure that they're being treated fairly and getting paid correctly? Yeah, there are some the association there are like, we have this uh, Nepal Mountain Guide Association. They are like a, a guide association and... I think they are very, they're kind of aware of the guide, guide safety is first. They always say the like guide safety is first to make sure they're first. But they have like different organizations, smaller organizations, but not a big, a real one. So I think they need to protect themselves. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have that, yeah, anyone. Like some companies... Some, there are some of the few good companies that they train their guide really well. They train their guide to be very professional. And so, but it's so many thousands of climbers. So some of them are not that professional. And it's a very big competition here in the, with the, this business. And and so it's going to happen. And in this mountain, and uh, what, what, every, every, anything can happen. Some of, the, some of them died because of, like, 
avalanche, ice fall, even the strong climbers die from big avalanches, snowfall, rockfall, but some climbers die from the health issue like heart attack, some by the altitude sickness, and few un- also some are from like not physically well, they cannot walk, and, and at those 8,000 meters above, uh, even Sherpa are really, really strong. They need to survive, and they cannot carry them, so, and they died. Wow. And it, it makes, yeah, when, when, when seeing that, sometimes it feels, oh, this is very scary. And after 8,000 meters, it's called, we call it dead zone. So after that, you can see, after, after that level, then you can see a lot of, a lot of things, and it's kind of like a war zone, <laughs> like people dragging, people crying, people like dying, and oh my god! <laughs> but if, but if you're fit, if you're very fit, you're prepared, and you have a really good guide, really experienced guide, then you can, and they know how to, and the guide can tell you like, you oh, you're not doing well, you should you should turn around and. Then if the clients listen to them and they will survive, and if they don't listen, no, I should summit because I paid this much money, then they can do nothing except kicking up there, wow. and and maybe on the way they might die or something that happens. Wow. So then, is is guiding Everest? maybe not as enjoyable because of all of the extra precautions and that fear factor? Or like, do you get the same, I don't know if it's like endorphins or a rush or enjoyment out of, you know, guiding Everest as you would uh, Denali? Guiding Everest, yeah. I like guiding Everest, uh, but also a certain time at the summit push time period of the sun, this time are really hard, but other time I... A lot of people there, and it's a big season. I think it's a big income of Nepal, and mm. also is a sometimes you really like it, sometimes you really hate it. So it's kind of mixture. I cannot tell, <laughs> but uh, I mean, lo- I love being there and having good time in base camp, and all people there, all people often all over are climbing there, and and it's uh, yeah. But uh, guiding climbing Everest is easier but guiding or like working on Everest is very hard yeah and uh and the most of the guides big biggest income is on spring by from the Everest than any other season so yeah I see and it, it's been in fact very hardly this spring because I think hundreds of people have no job and I think our government has nothing for backup for climber and Wow. I think, yeah. And the Sherpa people are the one who bring, who helps to, who, that Sherpa are the one who works on the mountain and get the income in Nepal, but the government is not, not, and nothing for, not, not doing nothing for them right now. So it's quite sad. Yeah, that's scary. I saw that, um, I think in, in, in your hometown, in your village, you helped recently to create some uh, some roots up the mountain, or maybe, what should I say, like... Uh, uh, Rock climbing roads? Yeah, like you created some some like trails up the mountain, is that true? Yeah, so I grew up mountain, and when I grew up in mountain, I never, we were just playing around, and the place I where, where I born is the really good spot for a, we have a lot of rocks and I we thought some part of my training during International Mountain Guard we trained on those rocks so uh, me and my two friends from North Face uh, Josie and Savannah uh, they both are North Face athletes and we had a fund from North every year we had a travel fund that we need to use it for a good cause so I think we decided to use that fund for to go to Rawaling and create this very new route in the rock, like a real vaulting. And uh, mm. in Nepal, this is very strange thing that women does. So then uh, we make the only goal trip to make a rock route in Rawaling, where I'm from. So and we prepared everything and everything went well and we may made. Uh, like some of them are like 25 meter to 30 meter 
rock real route climbing, rock climbing with boats, sport climbing. So we stayed 10 days and we made like nine routes there. And the elevation was the 4,200 meter. Wow. So, so we made a playground for this new young climbers that who can climb and train and go wild and valley because it's a very beautiful place to train because it's in 4,200 meter. So you can, like, if you can climb there and train there, stay there. And really, in the winter time, we have big ice climbing and, and, but also we want some rocks. And so we plan to make some routes and it was really fun. And, and I think this is the first time in Nepal that a trip girl made this route. Usually all the boys does that with drill machines and ropes. So that was like really cool project. Uh, and I want to promote my valley as a, as a climber from there. So I want also uh, promote my hometown where I'm born and also, uh, so we want more female to climb and train and you just kind of uh, example we are giving. So we planned a trip and been very good. Yeah, one of the best trips. Yeah, that's amazing. Is is yeah, that thanks. is that something that might be able to also bring some money to the village if, if people come and climb there? Yeah. So yeah, if we have a lot of rock the the there if there's a lot of rock to climb then a lot of tourists can come and stay mm. in the village and climb. So that is also a good money for the villager and the hotel owner the who runs the and also it's good for promoting the promoting valley and brings quite a good money, yeah. Like even a local people came and live there and climbed for a week, then it's good economically. It's yeah, very helpful. Oh, that's great. I saw yeah, some... if there is like we have a really good ice climbing, a uh, winter ice fall, but sometimes a lot of people comes from Montana, both Montana, Norway to climb that ice, but sometimes they can say, Oh, it's too tired, too cold. Now we can just go for a sun rock climbing. Then there is a route there. So, wow. Yeah, I saw some really cool pictures of you working with something called the Nomad Clinic, and I was wondering if you could talk about what that is. Yeah, Nomad is uh, also a really cool. It's very uh, nice trip. I've been for this trip uh, two times, two years. But I've been know the Nomad trip since long time because I've been following their page and I work. Uh, it's a not, it's a run by an American named John Roshi Holifax from Santa Fe, New Mexico. So she, what do we do? It we go to this very not in Kumbu or not in this touristic area, but we go far, far west, very remote place with mules, dung horses, and 20, 25 doctors from America, all over the state, and uh, midwife, lot of, all kinds of doctors. We have dental, pediatric, uh, neurologists, and a lot of uh, women's, uh, women's clinic. So we go and Tibet and herbal medicines and therapists for like body, dental, and not an eye because it's hard to deal. So, so we go through all this every September 18 to October 18. Uh, I do this one month trip with Nomad Clinic. So I for on those trips we do like sometimes we we treat like more than thousand wow. people on one trip. And so the Roshi, the one who Roshi love, who been doing this is for like 20 years. She's like 77 and she traveled with us in the horse. And yeah, it's really, really cool trip. It's very, for me, it's very good break from the mountain life and going through this remote valley and helping this uh, people. It may, really feels you like, makes you very happy. And especially I work for the girls uh, for translating the girls issue and teaching a hygiene and mint like we also give them a washable uh pads for the monthly cycle mm -hmm. and we teach them a lot of things so yeah i work for the mostly girls 
and uh, ghost house and and also they have they don't speak english so i need to i do translate a lot and and if there is some big passes like high altitude issue came or if there's a some lot of we have a lot of doctors and some of them are if they have problem then i also help them help the other doctors to make sure they're good in high altitude and they do well they eat good so yeah so i work for a uh, normally time in the clinic i go for the women's clinic and when we go hike in the high valley then i help out with a doctor who are having heart problem and i guide for the doctors yeah so it is uh is one of the good time in my life like every month so you, you can it makes me really good cuz i'm not about the it's not about mountain climbing yeah. summit and so it's about helping other and is no yeah that's a nomad clinic so i also thought about joining this year if everything's happen good then we'll see <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing too. You you uh you make me feel very lazy because you're doing <laughs> you're doing so many things. Um I, I have one more question for you. I think it's a simple mm-hmm. one. Um when you know, when I first wrote to you, I wrote that I had been away um in Asia for about six months and I kinda kicked around the world for about a year. And I really wanted to get to Nepal and to Bhutan. And when I was overseas, I had a lot of trouble getting uh, my bank in the States to wire the money that was required to get to Bhutan for the, the daily uh-huh. taxes and fees there. So I said, I'm going to wait because I want to, when I'm in that part of the world, I want to make sure I get to both countries. So I haven't yet been to Nepal. But, uh, you know, as we talked about, I had Ben on the podcast. I had Mira. Now I have you. Oh, uh, Yeah. 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 Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the country and its beauty and the culture. Uh, so I was just wondering if, if, if very simply you could share, uh, besides climbing, outside of climbing and summiting, what do you love about Nepal? Yeah, besides Mount Everest or Mount whatever mountain, <laughs> I really love about mountain in Nepal. We have a very a different culture. We have a two culture here, a Buddhist, which is us and the Hindu, the Buddhist and Hindu have two religion here, and we have a lot of cool t- in a, around the city. We have a lot of cool temples, and we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of custom, and we, every tribe has their own mm. food, their own dialogue, and their own culture and dresses. And like us, Sherpa has Sherpa food, Sherpa dress, Sherpa culture. So it's very different than other Nepali. And if you go to far west, you can see it's very good uh, forest. If you go to Mustang, also very beautiful. Like you can, it can feel like you're in the Grand Canyon or somewhere. And Mustang, a lot of good monastery is kind of desert. And so it's a very small country, but we have divided into a lot of different culture, different homeland, different uh, types of food, and a lot of temples, of course, and river. We don't have sea, and definitely a lot of mountains. And we have so many mountains that we even don't count a lot of peaks. <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, we call them hills, and in the other country, they call it mountains. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, mostly, yeah, culture, temples, monasteries, and food and people are different kind of faces. Uh, some are like, looks like, yeah, the faces are different and costumes and that's all I and love. And then the people are very friendly. Um, and the family of our, like our family friends are like very, very close. So they all about a family things here. Yeah, they really take care of each other and they stay connected and, in my family, I'm the only one like is never there, but other siblings are like very, very well connected. And yeah, so it's all about family, culture and religion and yeah. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm, it's actually quite early here, and I'm about to wrap up so that I can get ready for work. Uh, but I want to say thank yeah. you. I think like what you're doing and your story is really inspirational. I know it's inspired a lot uh-huh. of people in Nepal and a lot of young women, but I'm a dude over here yeah. in, in New York, and it's inspired me as well. So thank you for allowing yeah. me to share your story and for you know chatting with me here this morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and give me to share my stories. And I hope to uh, see you again or uh, talk to you soon. <laughs> That is a wrap on episode number 162 of the Voyages of Tim Vetter podcast. Ah, so cool. I really, really enjoy these these episodes where I'm able to connect with someone on the other side of the world from from my Brooklyn apartment. But I can't wait to be on the other side of the world sometime soon. Please, please, please. I really hope things get better soon. But until then, I will keep these episodes coming to you remotely. Got a lot of stuff planned this week and a couple things in the pipe for next week. So uh, there will be no shortage of content here, folks. All right. Thanks, everyone. As always, please take care of each other. I will catch you next time. Bye-bye.